Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel, House Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see somewhere behind me, it's Tropical House Plants. Now today is going to be a continuation of the plant review series, and it's going to be for a plant that I never thought I was going to review, but I know a lot of people have actually asked, have I got any of this type of plant? And by this type of plant, I mean ferns. And more specifically, today I'm going to be reviewing a maidenhair fern. And I know this is one of the plants that a lot of people try in the beginning. Sometimes you can find it in supermarkets. I'll touch on that in just a minute. And this can be a bit of a challenging plant for a lot of people. I've had some good success with it every time I've owned it. I think this is now the third plant. And the only reason why I don't have three in my collection is because at some point I get bored and get rid of them, usually to a friend who probably will end up killing them because they won't listen to what I tell them in terms of keeping them happy. Not to claim that I know exactly what you need to do to keep a maidenhair fern happy, but I've not really had any problems so far. So I thought I'd share kind of my experiences and kind of what I do during this review. And yeah, before we get into anything else, let's lay down some ground rules. So if you're one of the regulars and have come back for more, welcome back. It's nice to have you. You know the deal by this point. If you want to skip to your favorite section, you can do so by clicking on the chapter in the progress bar down below. And if you are new, welcome to the slight insanity that is this plant review series. Now, I'll start this off as I usually do and just kind of say that there is no way for these reviews to be unbiased. It is my review of my specific plant in my specific conditions, which are growing in a conservatory in the UK and whatever that might mean. This plant is in the conservatory and most of the maidenhair ferns that I have got, I will caveat that and say they have been in situation, I think, barring one actually, of the three, one wasn't in a slightly higher level of humidity, but none of them really struggled. But I'll get to that in just a minute. So all of this to say is basically take this with a pinch of salt because your experiences might be different. If you've got challenges with this plant, if you've had success with this plant and your kind of situation, your review, all of these things are different than mine, drop them down below. I'm sure a lot of people would like to know this isn't a particularly difficult plant to come by, at least not here in the UK. So I think a lot of people might be quite interesting. But yeah, let's dive into the first pick. So this is the plant in question, and you can see how much, this is going to sound horrible, how much I care about this plant. It is in a nursery pot, it's not in its own nursery pot, and I will touch on that in care and accessories, and it is in a water reservoir, and that's kind of giving you a big hint here as to why I've always been able to keep them happy. Now for the eagle-eyed amongst you, you might turn around and say, but Memo, this isn't looking particularly happy in the middle, there's some crispiness and things like that. Yes, and I'm not gonna shy off, I'm not gonna be one of these people that's gonna like chop off the crispy bits, but I wanted you to kind of see the realities of owning a plant like this. This is still a very happy plant. This is, I think, a year old now. The, the title will have it. So not a plant that I've had for many years, but as I mentioned earlier on in the video, it's not a plant that I particularly want to have for many years. But let's dive into some background. I'll drop this down because I'm holding it and it's relatively heavy. Um, and I'll see maybe if I can actually get it to be high enough so you can see it for the majority of the video. I will be inserting some close-up clips as I usually do. So yeah, yeah I do need to find a little tangent here, but I do need to find something like a stool so I can put these plants up high enough that you can actually see them because my table is a bit low in relation to where I am standing. So I will find that. I'll probably just be inserting clips or lifting the plant and showing you. But the thing I wanted to say about this specific plant and the bit of the background, basically. So uh, again, it wasn't a plant that I was particularly looking for. You can generally find it in most places, but I did find it in a local plant nursery. And it was the only reason why I picked it up again after I've had two previously is because of a video probably just over a year ago now on my channel where I was talking about Pond. And I think it was kind of the realities of Pond. And I'll link it at the top there. But it was a situation where one of 
one of you lovely followers actually had actually mentioned that you can grow ferns in pond as well but you might need to leave the soil that it comes with. So instead of draining all the soil off, because obviously if anybody knows with ferns, the, the roots are like hairs basically, so they can snap off quite easily. If you try to let something like a fern go fully dry so you can easily take off the soil, damage might already be done to the fern and you might not be able to revive it at that point. And trying to get wet soil off of fern roots, which is so, so tiny, is also a challenge. So I kind of assumed that point blank, it couldn't really be done until this individual said, look, no, get pots. So I'm trying to explain, let me, I think I've got some compacted soil in a pot and I'll show you what I mean. Uh, it is useful when you are a bit lazy and a bit messy and you've still got these things two years later. So this is something I've been meaning to throw away for nearly two years now. This, I can't remember what this died. Oh, this might've been string of hearts actually. But so imagine this was the soil. So you take it out of the pot, the soil already has all the roots and everything. Obviously, this would be a live plant on the top. And you would then find a bigger pot, put a layer of pond in, in the bottom, basically, which is I'm telling you what I've done now. This is part of the care as well. But layer of pond at the bottom, put this in the middle, and then fill it up with pond around and pond on top. And that was the way that it was described to me. And that is what I have done with this plant. However, the other things that it's worth noting, basically, as I said, this was a relatively small plant. I don't, unfortunately, normally here is where I would add a picture of what this plant looked like when I first got it. I don't have it because I didn't care. <laughs> Sounds horrible. I didn't care enough about this plant to put it in my plant care app, which basically meant this kind of got water reservoir filled whenever I saw it, it was dry, or maybe just before it went dry. And I was kind of like, you know what, this is an experiment, so I don't really care. But a year later, I thought, you know what, let's do a review because a year later, this is doing fine. And I'll come on to the crispy bits in just a moment, basically. But yeah, it's it's doing okay. It's doing okay. A year later, in the pond, in very, very bad conditions. And all I can say is I'm actually relatively surprised. As I said, I've, I've had good luck with these plants in the past, but I am relatively surprised that this is doing as well as it has. But I think that's everything I wanted to touch on background. It's not a particularly like massive background section with this because it was a relatively non-eventful thing. I found it at the nursery. I picked it up because of a suggestion that somebody made and I tried an experiment and the results have been good. Really, really surprised. So I thought I'd share. So coming into speed of growth with this one, and it's really interesting because I thought with the pond and everything else that it might actually be slower than when I had it in soil. And just to give a bit of context, when I had it in a soil mix, or a lot of the times in just what the grower had kind of provided, maybe I might have done a repot and just added more soil and popped it up basically, but it was always in some form of an aroid mix or some form of growing media that wasn't on a semi-hydro. So back in those days, I'd get something small in terms of a plant and it would be a full plant like the one that you're seeing here. And by small, I mean like maybe two or three fronds. And it'd be something like this, maybe after a year, year and a half, basically. But, and I would give it like decent light and it was next to humidifiers and all of these things, which this one hasn't done. Granted, it's in the conservatory, so it does get some good ambient high humidity levels, but it still grew as fast. And if anything, what I will say about this, and I'll see if I can get a reading and add it up here as well, it is next to a very, one of my weakest kind of grow light, LED grow lights, and it's not even directly underneath it. it the, the weak grow light is above my water propagation with the air stones. Again, I've done a video, I'll link it at the top, but it's kind of off to the side and it's right next to the radiator of this room. So at some point, this plant gets dry. Granted, some of you might say that, you know what, it's right next to the, the bubbler and that water propagation vessel. So it's probably getting some humidity rising from that. You'd probably be right. Probably some humidity rising from the water reservoir on the bottom of it, probably right. However, you've seen the state of it. It seems to be fine and it's grown exponentially in the year that I have had it. Same thing I've experienced with the actual soil media as well, is you get it with two or three fronds, 
and then it just becomes this big, big thing a year later. And you could potentially keep this going for a lot longer because for me, a lot of the ferns get a bit scraggly and a bit weird after a while. This one tends to keep its kind of bushiness quite nicely. And I get why people like it, those delicate leaves and all of these things. So I don't know how I can benchmark this against um, a golden pothos, and I keep looking at it down, basically I'll pick it up so you can see it again, because <laughs> these leaves are really difficult for me to turn around and say, you know what, if a golden pothos in the summer brings out two or three leaves, this will bring out the same. It doesn't quite work the same way. So I would kind of go for a full frond of leaves. So I would say kind of in the summer, this might bring out four or five fronds a month, I would say on average, basically. In the winter, it might be one or two fronds a month if it's kind of happy. And in fairness, we're in the depths of winter now, so it does get occasionally a bit cold in here, and it's it seems to have kind of slowed down. But overall, it's not a particularly slow plant as long as you keep it happy. And I think that's the thing that a lot of people might struggle with a lot of the times with maiden hair ferns is keeping it happy. There's a lot to be said about keeping the humidity levels up, but again, I will come back to what I've said on previous videos. If you get the watering right and the plant has access to the right level of water when it needs that right level of water, the humidity, even with something as papery thin as the leaves of the maiden hair fern, and I'll show you kind of how papery thin it is in case you haven't seen one of these in person, they are very, very thin. Think think thinner than like crepe paper. So yeah, you would kind of understand that, you know what, this definitely will need the humidity even if you've got the watering right. But actually I found the second plant that I was growing in regular household humidity, as long as it had access to water, then it was fine basically. In terms of propagation with this one, I haven't really ever propagated a fern or this one specifically. They do have those fertile fronds, I think, at the bottom. So I don't know whether or not that's gonna show up. I'm trying to see, yeah, you might be able to see those little dots. So those are the ways that you would propagate it the same way that you would kind of like, I think it's where you would get spores. I might be wrong about this, but I think that's where you get spores or something along the lines. I'll correct myself at the top if it isn't exactly that. And you would kind of lay it on some soil and eventually it would grow into a new plant. Or what you can do a lot of times with ferns is just yank it, split the soil entirely and just do it by division. And I've done that twice and that's always been successful. That really hasn't had much of a problem. To be fair, as long as you're leaving some of the soil, soil, some of the soil and roots, more importantly, you need to leave some roots on there, on both of the plants, both the mother plant and the one that you split off the mother plant, then you're generally going to be okay. Expect some time of the plant throwing a bit of a hissy fit. And this one has a very specific way of showing it to you by everything going a bit crispy for a bit. But it will eventually bounce back. Just give it the kind of good conditions that you would give it normally. What you would have, if you're dividing it, it would probably would have had the mother plant for a while. And it should remain happy, basically. Other than that, because it's a division, it kind of gets going relatively quickly. It doesn't get knocked back, at least in my experience, too, too much. As I said, I don't know because I've not done the spore thing potentially, but I know that can take a long time and you need really specific conditions. And I'm not the person to tell you anything about propagating ferns in that way because I have never attempted it because, and I'm going to be quite honest here and correct me if you've done this and you think it's the easiest thing in the world, let me know. But it seems like an awful lot of trouble. And I'm going to be a bit blunt with this for a plant that you don't have to spend a lot of money to pick up from most places. So I'm just a bit like, you know, uh, if this was something that was exceptionally difficult to come by and it was very, very expensive, and I know it shouldn't be a factor, but it kind of is for me with this one, yeah, I would probably go to more trouble to propagate it. If it doesn't do well, I can always replace it, basically. Now coming on to availability, and this is obviously I've touched on it a few times now, but this is a plant that at least for me, in my experience, I have seen it in supermarkets, I have seen it in plant stores, I have seen it in garden centers and plant nurseries. All of these places will generally have this plant. It's not one that you will generally see as out of stock, especially on the plant stores. 
The supermarkets will get it on occasion, at least here. And I've seen this in big box stores. It's generally everywhere. And to be fair, the price of it, because it's a relatively common houseplant at this point, its price is kind of mid single digits, basically. It's a, <laughs> mid single digits. Maybe if you get a relatively large one, you might get to the like 10 or 15 mark. But generally speaking, at least here, this isn't super expensive. I'd be really interested if you're from a specific part of the world where it's difficult to come by ferns. I'm thinking even back home in Greece for me, ferns don't do that well with that kind of dry heat, basically. So ferns can be quite challenging to come by and they can be quite expensive and they tend to be very specialist plants. But at least here, relatively easy to find. But I'd be really interested if you're in the parts of the world where you, these things don't come up super often, how rare is it to find them and how expensive could they potentially be? But yeah, it's a plant that, as I said, generally, at least my experience, you can find it most places. I don't think this is going to get any more expensive. I don't know if there's do I know if there's any variegated ferns? There probably is. Or there's probably ferns with stable variegation. I'm thinking some of the ferns that have got kind of silver margins or maybe white margins. But those tend to be different types of ferns, if that makes sense. I don't think there is a variegated form of this. I am sure somebody will correct me in the comments down below, but I think it is just the green form. There are different sizes of leaves. So if I show you the plant again, you might be able to see some of the tiny 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 foliage that you might get there and if i put it in front of me you can see how tiny that foliage is sometimes you can get some some of these maiden hair ferns where each one of those little bits of leaf are actually quite large so i know that is a case i think there might be one that the leaves are even smaller so i think this is the kind of standard form so there is that and those can be a tiny bit more expensive on occasion when I've seen them. So maybe very, 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 very low double digits, but that's pretty much where it's going to be. And generally, it's a plant that's readily available. I will say this is also another plant that if you're just starting off and you don't want to go through the faff and the rigmarole of this, and yes, some of this is a bit more of that throwaway nature, unfortunately, but a lot of the times when something is this cheap, even if it won't look pristine the whole time you're going to have it and even if you're only realistic and you're going to be able to keep it happy and alive for about three months for that kind of price it's better than cut flowers because at least you've then got a living thing in your house you might need to baby it and to be fair this is <laughs> oh, baptism of fire here um, and i could already hear the comments on this one this could be an interesting one to start on if you're getting into ferns and there's a reason why i'm going through this because essentially this is ferns at the most difficult, at least from what I've heard from other people. So if you can keep this alive and you get this, the care for this plant down pat, then you should be able to keep most other ferns alive. And I know that's a sweeping generalization, but it gives you a good basis to go on. I know a lot of the times the kind of advice when you're first starting off with something like a fern that can be a bit challenging is to go for like you know a bird uh, bird's nest fern and all these things which they're a lot more forgiving i found that really interesting when i was starting out that was possibly the worst bit of advice because you sit there going i've kept this plant that's arguably relatively easy to keep happy and alive in relation to other ferns happy so i'm surely going to be doing great for some of the other ferns and then you go into the, the realities of some of the the slightly more specific burn care and you're just like oh no I didn't know anything I'm just like yeah so a false kind of confidence that it provides I think if you get this and you get this happy enough you should be able to keep most other friends happy as well because eh. but yeah I think that's everything I wanted to say on availability let's move on So pests on this one, I'll see if I can bring it up. I don't know whether or not you're going to be able to see it. And I'll show you the back of the plant, which looks <laughs> horrendous. Uh, this plant definitely has a, a front and a back, basically. I don't know whether or not you're going to see some of this. I don't know if you can, maybe, if that's coming up on the screen. I'll see it in editing, basically. But this, I only realized this when I picked it up because I have not picked it up since I put it where I put it. And I've just been refilling the reservoir has a lovely spider web and it's not spider mites it's actually a spider web because it's caught other things in it and i'm just like great 
you do you. I like a good spider in this space because it does a lot of the pest management for me. But I will say, previous versions of this plant, I have maybe had spider mites on occasion. And if you've got spider mites on something, at least in my experience, on something like a maidenhair fern, spider mites aren't going to be your only issue. The humidity or the, the water going to the plant is a, the bigger issue that you're going to have to deal with there at that point. And because it's so papery, I will say, and I don't think I've actually, have I had mealybugs? Maybe mealybug occasionally on this plant, nothing else. I don't think I've ever had thrips. It's way too thin for something like a thrips. At least in my experience, thrips like the more succulent leaves, think Monstera deliciosa. Again, my experience with that. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting one because it's so delicate and it can be so sensitive as a plant that any form of treatment, even when I tried to do something like neem or I tried to do something that was more of a chemical or something like a soapy solution or anything like that, will crisp up the leaves. So I don't know, if have you ever managed to get pests, something like a spider mite, on a maidenhair fern and treat them without turning your plant into kind of rubbish, basically, at that point? I'm sure it will bounce back eventually, but... The process of treating this specific plant sometimes I found for pests will probably do more damage faster than actually treating the pests rather than at that point again. I don't like doing this, especially because I really do kind of follow what Sarah, the plant rescuer, talks about. There is that kind of throwaway nature of it all, at least compost it, if nothing else, and just get another one at that point. It sounds horrible, but uh, it might just be easier for that kind of price level. Start again. Learn your lesson and start again at that point. But yeah, I think that's everything in terms of pests for this. It's not a particularly pest-prone plant other than maybe the occasional spider mites. But again, as I said, there's a bigger issue there if you're getting spider mites on a fern. So coming into accessories and care, and I will lift the plant up again so I can show you the crispy bits. So let's talk crispy bits. And let me see if I can kind of do this without spilling water everywhere down below. So how that happened was, and I don't know how many people have been around or were aware that at some point, the beginning of this year, January time is usually the time when I'll go back home to Greece to see family and friends. And I went away and I kind of gave instructions to care for all my plants. And again, this isn't on my plant care app. It's not one that I tend to notice that often. It's right next to a radiator. I forgot to tell the person that was watering to water this plant. So there was double whammy as well because some of the lights that this was getting also wasn't switched on for the whole two weeks that I was away. It also went bone dry because I didn't say, look, refill the water reservoir. That's where the crispy bits come from. They haven't got any worse. If anything, I've got new leaves that have come through and it seems happy basically, but that's the big point I wanted to make here in terms of its care and how to really keep this happy at least in my experience, it is going to be down to the watering more so than the humidity, actually. So the humidity is good if you can give it the humidity and it will give you an easier time. But this really was a bit of a game changer for me as well, because what I found, and to be fair, this and the way that I was doing it before both work. The way that I was doing it before is it was in its soil media, I got something like a knitting needle, something like long poking device. It could be a chopstick, it could be anything you want it to be, basically. And I shoved in something called wicking rope, basically, without disturbing too many of the roots. Yes, I did disturb some of the roots, and yes, I did get some crisping, but that didn't, it wasn't a huge amount, and it didn't last for very long, and it kind of bounced back relatively quickly. And then I made sure that there was two bits of the, so the wick went into the soil and out the other side, so there was two bits hanging out the bottom, I think sometimes I've seen it from some of the American YouTubers when they show kind of big box stores. That might be sometimes how these plants come to you in something like Lowe's, maybe. We don't have that over here, by the way. And making sure that there's a water reservoir underneath it, elevate it. So this is the thing, it gets a bit involved. Make sure that you're elevating it so it's not sitting in water, especially if it's in soil, and make sure that those wicks are in the soil and make sure that this has happened after you've just watered. And it will keep sapping up the water as much as it is. I did this with an opaque 
kind of um, cash po and I'll show you. So imagine this was the reservoir and this was the pot and I had it at the bottom there and it was wicking up. The problem with this is I couldn't see and it's actually quite impressive how thirsty this plant got because that was emptying a large chunk of that water within a day or two, especially in the summer and especially when it got warmer, it got huge at some point. So the first one I had was probably four times the size of this after a year, basically. But it had all the right conditions. It was getting better light. It was all these things. But, uh -uh. but so that was one way of doing it. This I have actually found is easier. And if you're watching this video, the person I cannot remember who gave that comment, thanks. This was a great tip. And hopefully by me sharing it, the, the knowledge can go further afield. So this way around was a lot easier. You could have something like the clear um, kind of cash po, not cash po, it's like a drip tray, basically. This is an old like Tupperware container. Is it an actual Tupperware container? No, this is something that food came in, basically. It's not even something that I bought. But reusing plastic, yay. Anybody else have got like old kind of, what's it called? Uh, butter pots or yogurt pots that you're just using. Probably not just me. I know it's probably not going to be any of the people that have got the kind of Instagram worthy like plants all over the house. Yeah, but I do. And it's granted it's not it's in here. I don't want to say I don't know. I think if somebody's seen my house house tour of house plants, you've probably seen some <laughs> questionable reusing of plastic pots. But yeah, this is great because I can see what's happening. And as I said, do that, it gets the water level that it needs. And the humidity is an issue. As I said, this is right next to a radiator. And the crisping didn't happen because of the radiator. It happened because it dried out for two weeks. <laughs> and to be fair, it could have been a lot worse. It could have killed off the entire plant, but it didn't. And it's an accolade to this plant that it did as well as it did within that kind of semi-hydro because it still had the soil. I would imagine the roots that were kind of attached to the pond that have come out of that root mass that had the soil inside of it, probably some of them died back because they got too dry, but that soil probably stayed a bit more moist, basically. And generally, I wouldn't do this from some of my other aroids because that could cause root rot really quickly. But with this plant, mm, this is also one of those plants that you can't have sitting in water generally. So either you do the self-wicking with kind of something like a, a soil mix or doing it this way with the pond, or kind of in a semi-hydro situation, I don't think Lekka would work. I think the, the Lekka is too big, basically. So you need something like the semi-hydro, or if you're buying something from like Soul Ninja, it would be the semi-hydro mix, but the fine rather than the coarse. And you're fine. And to be fair, I kind of re-fell in love a bit with something like a maiden hair fern, because I still think it's a pretty plant, but Am I going to keep this for much longer? Probably not. I need the space. But this might get gifted to, because I know a lot of people always go, oh, I really like the look of that fern, blah, blah. And I will give it to somebody else, and hopefully they won't. <laughs> it. I will tell them what I've done with it, but past experiences. And I, I won't deny this isn't necessarily an easy plant. Again, based on what I've heard from people, I found it relatively straightforward. But I know that might just be a me thing, basically, with this one. But yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say about this. Obviously, there's nothing like su support sticks. I fertilize this the same way that everything else gets fertilized in here. So the um, liquid gold leaf that I would mix into my water weekly, every time that I water, this would get the same thing. Seems to be fine. The light levels, as I said, are shockingly low for this. If you give it more light, it will be happier for a lot longer. But yeah, I think that other than that, it doesn't have too much of a specific need. It's that humidity or and or getting that watering level right. And you should have a very happy made in her fern. At least that's been my experience. How many times have I said that now? But this is one that I really want to heavy caveat it throughout this video because I know from other people that this isn't always the case. So this had been my experiences. So coming into final thoughts for this plant, and it's interesting doing this on a fern. I don't think I've ever done this on a fern before. Based on what I know now, if I didn't have this plant, would I purchase this plant? Normally, I would say no, because I've kind of given up on a lot of ferns. I'm trying to think. I've only got the crocodile fern, and I'm, I'll see if I can put the name up the top there, and this at the moment in my space. But let me be fair, the crocodile fern is a bit of a forgotten plant. It's got a 
uh, kind of drip system, the, the watering spikes, and it's kind of pulling in from there. But actually, I said this before that I would never get it again after the first one. Then I got the second one. I said it after the second one. Got it afterwards to do the experiment. So maybe never say never. I probably wouldn't go out of my way to find this again, but it might be one that people keep purchasing over and over again. I get I get the the fascination with this plant and the way that it looks, basically. But into <laughs> oh, the scoring is going to be horrendous on this for me to kind of give it a proper score. As a house plant, and I would probably put most ferns into this, out of 10, zero being the worst, 10 being the best, I would give most ferns, this one included, a two or a three at a push. They are, I get why people would like a fern in their house. They're very difficult to keep happy. Ferns that I have here in the UK that are in the garden, granted slightly different than the tropical ferns that we might have in the house, at least in my location, they tend to grow quite happily. They might die back for the winter and come back in the summer, but they're getting everything that they need. I find ferns particularly challenging to grow. Not to be said that it cannot be done, because we all fall down our own rabbit hole. So a lot of people might go down the rabbit hole of aroids in general, or actually go more specialized that they only like philodendrons, or they only like anthuriums, or they only like syngoniums, or monsteras. Other people might go down the begonia rabbit hole. There's a lot of people that will go down the fern rabbit hole. That's absolutely fine as well. Do you basically, and obviously your care then will be aimed towards all of your ferns. But for the average person getting a fern, it can be a challenging plant. I'm not going to lie. Based on my experience with what I've done with all of my fern or my maidenhair ferns specifically so far, I'm trying to think now, I would probably give it a five or six, maybe. As long as, like, my, again, my experience in the way that I'm growing it, it's been an okay plant to grow. Does it set my world on fire? No, most ferns generally won't with me. And I've had different ferns over the years, basically. I've tried several times. Um, uh, yeah, the maidenhair fern is fine for me. And it's, again, because it's so easy to find. And I, I, I like the daintiness of it all. And it's it can be quite different from a lot of the other ferns that have got those fronds that happen out that, that look like kind of pinations I found out or even kind of the bird nesty kind of ones this is very different I don't think there's an awful lot of ferns that I found at least that grow in this kind of pattern of that kind of frilliness and I kind of never got the hype until I saw one everyone was like why does everybody want a maiden her own it just looks a bit bushy and fluffy and I get it I do get it so yeah for this one the scoring wouldn't be too bad but yeah I think that's everything I wanted to say for this. this is an odd one for me. I, just, I never thought I was going to do a review on a fern, but you know what? The year later, it's still here. I thought, why not? Somebody might find this useful. But yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.